Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. May I please remind you all to be seated. The conference will begin very shortly. Today is the last day of our conference already, and time just seems to be flying by very quickly. This is the last day of the conference. Cultural wisdom for climate action: the Southeast Asians' contribution. I'm sure you have the first two day of a very insightful and informative that engage you guys into a lot of discussions. So this is the last day. Um, may I please remind you that the conference is compassionately brought to us by Bigrim, who is our main sponsor. And as you probably listened to Mr. Ling's speech yesterday, it was very fascinating on the tiger conservation project that Bigrim did as part of so many initiatives that they are doing, and along the same line as the philosophy that we are discussing now on how to protect our heritage culture. So. Without further ado, the first session for today is the seventh session: traditional political, social heritage, and climate resilience. The session will be led by two moderators, which is Miss Camille Ma and Miss Lisa Malabonga. Miss Camille Ma is a Saudi is a CHA advisor as well as the council member of the Siam Society. She has a long celebrated tenure of、um, career in corporate finance and investment, and she has been involved in lecturing as well as the curriculum development for the Thailand Institute of Director. And Miss Lisa, yesterday you already listened to her presentation yesterday in the afternoon. She is also one of our youth representative from Philippines, and she's an advocate as well as an educator, doing a lot of work in. Um, trying to protect the indigenous local community, and so also share the, share the same passion with all of us, in trying to put the cultural wisdom from indigenous culture into the bigger strategy of how to mitigate the climate change. So, may I please、um, welcome both of our moderators, and may I invite all the speakers up to the front of the auditorium at this moment. Good morning, everyone.、Um, it's a pleasure and privilege to be opening、um, Panel Seven: Traditional, Political, Social Heritage, and Climate Resilience. I assure you that this is going to be a very engaging and interesting panel because、um, we will be dissecting politics、um, and climate nexus here in Southeast Asia. So this panel investigates the advantages and disadvantages of traditional, social, and political structures in Southeast. In Southeast Asia, that impact climate action. So, for our first presentation this morning,、um, it will be opened by、um, Dr. Muhammad Rivani Bustami.、Um, he will be talking about the decolonization and indigenization of social heritage environment nexus, liberating Nusantara Malay Archipelago and Southeast Asia from colonial. Epistemicide. That's quite a mouthful, isn't it?、Um, he is currently the head of Nusantara Malay Archipelago Research at the Center for Policy Research and International Studies, Universitas Sains Malaysia, the oldest social science research center in Malaysia. He is also the founding advisor to Mal Malindo Research Center at Mihi Universitas. Muhammadia Jogjakarta, Indonesia. In addition, he is the editor in chief for the International Journal of Multicultural and Multireligious Understanding, based in Germany, as well as the founder of Iwin Library. So, ladies and gentlemen, I share the floor with Dr. Muhammad Rivani Bustami. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah.、Uh, good morning. Ohayo gozaimas. Wakremasen. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm I'm really truly honoured、uh, to be here. Uh, my uh, my deepest appreciation to the organisers, to C Chart, and and to the the sponsors. 
uh, this is a wonderful place. Um, uh, Bangkok is a wonderful city, right? They're very lively, very rich uh, culturally. Right? Um, well, let me let me begin with uh, uh, a note or two before I, I, I actually delve into what I want to present. Yeah. Um, when I use the word Nusantara, we just had a, a very interesting discussion this morning with uh, some scholars over here too. Um, I'm using the word Nusantara as a civilizational, geographical, uh, cultural uh, construct of uh, the Malay archipelago yeah, that, that extends from um, Sumatra uh, to Papua and Philippines as well and southern uh, provinces of Indonesia up to certain parts of Indochina as well. So uh, Nusantara is a concept which actually means between islands, between land, yeah, between islands. Yeah. So it is in a way uh, a, a Mediterranean concept of the Southeast Asian space uh, once upon a time before colonization. Right? So let me, let me begin with uh, my first line. Um, all right. I'm going to go straight away with the, the theory first. Right? I'll be talking about colonial epistemocide, which means the killing of uh, our, our, our own indige indigenous and local uh, episteme, own local wisdom and knowledge uh, by colonial uh, domination. Yeah? So uh, the argument is that, and it is actually uh, uh, in a, concept, a concept or a construct that has been uh, posited by uh, Fendria Herixman, right? and the argument is that if we do not decolonize our own knowledge, our own wisdom, right, we will continue to be trapped right, uh, in the colonial lenses of ourselves, of, 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 uh, of looking in the way we look at the world, the way we look at ourselves, the way we, we look at others will be through colonial lenses and in that sense eventually our own uh, knowledge our own wisdom will perish right? uh, and more and more we will uh, look at and, and, and value uh, ourselves our knowledge our heritage from the colonial lenses and actually uh, we might even look down at our own knowledge and our own heritage yeah uh, so, hence the pursuit of decolonization and indigenization of knowledge and, and other relevant dimensions. Right? Um, so, Nusantarization, which is what I'm proposing as, as a concept to deconstruct uh, colonial knowledge, is a theory or a process of decolonization by letting go of destructive colonial powers, paradigms, and elements, as well as to re empowering local wisdom and indigenous heritage of Nusantara while progressing towards uh, principle-centered futures. Right? That's actually a picture of, of, of Penang. Penang right? um, uh, what I'll be presenting today it comes from a book, uh, largely from a book that I uh, co-edited together with my Indonesian colleagues uh, on, on, uh, on, on nationalism. Right? So there are various aspects of uh, uh, decolonization, but I'll be focusing more on uh, decolonization of knowledge, decolonization of paradigms. But the, if you look at the, uh, the sentence at the bottom there, it's actually a proverb, uh, a Malay proverb, a Nusantara proverb, buang yang keroh ambil yang jernih. That is, uh, remove the impurities while you take in the good, yeah? uh, the, the, the wise, the, the clean, the pure. Right? Which means that in the process of decolonization, in the process of indigen indigenization, we do not remove everything we still keep and, maintain and retain the good, right? And uh, at the same time, reviving uh, our own identity, our own wisdom, our own heritage, right? So I'll be talking about three paradigms. And these three social paradigms, I argue, uh, there are a lot of paradigms, but there are three social paradigms that have, have a great impact in our treatment of environment. Uh, they are the paradigm of uh, property, paradigm of knowledge, paradigm of development. So Nusantarization is a, uh, is a process to, to decolonize these paradigms, right? So the first paradigm is paradigm of property, right? So the way we look at our countries right now, after colonization, right, is based on uh, 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 nation state. And nation state, the definition of nation state that we have adopted as uh, 
as a country in Southeast Asia, in fact, the whole world, yeah, is very much based on the Westphalian Treaty, the Westphalian Treaty, uh, uh, concept of state and nation state. Uh, it is a, it is a treaty that came about after a series of wars in, 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 in Europe, whereby they actually decide that the sovereignty of the country, sovereignty of the state, depends on the, uh, the territory. So boundaries are drawn, down, boundaries have been decided, and we are in a way being trapped by this way of looking at the world, right? So we have this Westphalian concept of clear boundaries. This is mine and that is yours, right? Uh, and if I cross this boundary, I can get killed. The whole idea of nine dotted lines, right? Yeah? Uh, and, and, uh, and we talk about protecting sovereignty by protecting our territories. So we do not share our territories. We do not want to share our seas. Tanggalam kan gitu kan? Our Indonesian people understand that. Right? We sink the seas. <laughs> we sink the ships that come to our borders. Right? Uh, so this is basically how we define our our space, right? Our geographical space and our our sovereignty based on this definition of boundaries, right? Now, and this is a colonized idea, right? Now, I told some of my Indonesian friends that I'll be talking about Yogyakarta. If I were to imagine uh, in, the, in the Nusantara world, uh, a good example, a good model of a Nusantara city, it would be Yogyakarta, right? Now, um, I know that Yogyakarta has actually changed in the last six months or a year, right? but I'll be talking about the Yogyakarta, I know that. <laughs> now, if, if you haven't been to Yogyakarta, I would recommend you. I, as a Malaysian, I'm, I'm not Indonesian, right? but I would recommend you. Why? If you go to Yogyakarta, this, this street and actually the many streets, it's called Malioboro, there you can see a different model of a city, a very different model of a city, where the, 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 the homeless, the, 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 the families, the lecturers, the professors, the students, uh, the musicians will come together and, and have, uh, uh, you know, they will eat together, they will eat in lesehan, which means uh, they, they are, uh, where you sit on, the, uh, on, on these mattresses and you, you will eat together, all right? Uh, and it is a fascinating kind of uh, 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 environment, an uh, urban environment, right? Not like Kuala Lumpur or Jakarta or many of the other cities where you know, it's basically an urban jungle, right? But here, uh, the pace is different, right? Uh, the, the feeling is different, right? It's, it's not about, you know, get shopping from one place to another. It's about enjoying the moment, uh, being with friends, uh, you know, uh, chatting, uh, ngopi, drink, uh, having uh, kopi jaws, yeah, they drink coffee together. So the idea is people sharing the streets together without having to necessarily shop and, and be absorbed in this consumerist uh, 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 culture, right? Uh, and by the way, that is actually a concept of commons, right? Shared space, shared oceans, shared activities, right? And in Yogyakarta, is the only province or, or, or autonomous region in, in, in Indonesia. There are three autonomous regions, Aceh, Yogyakarta, and Papua. Uh, Yogyakarta is where they have the king as the governor. And the king actually would let people use the lands around the, 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 the kraton, around the, around the palace. Uh, and they would stay there, they would live there. And if you see this picture up there, right? Here, here right? This is uh, called Abdi Dalam where they actually serve the palace, serve the, the needs of the palace, and you actually, they, some of them are uh, tour guides as well. Uh, and they can live around the palace. They do not own the space. The, the space, the land, the houses are owned basically by the, by the, by the, by the sultan, uh, and it can pass down to the next generation. So it's the idea of commons. UGM, right? some of uh, our speakers here is from UGM, Universitas Gajah Mada, is owned, the land is owned by the sultan, by the governor, right? But if you, you know, people can use it. So the idea of ownership is quite different then. It's about shared space, pets, shared properties, right? Uh, so the idea of public lands, public spaces, uh, and, and our old idea of kampung, village. Kampung is a, is, a, is a bahasa term, which means village, right? Where the English got the word compound from. Villages really do not have clear boundaries. They actually share the boundaries. The kids will, you know, will go from one house to another, will run around, and they do not have gates. Right? This is the idea of commons, of sharing 
our spaces, sharing our properties, right? Uh, and this has basically uh, been, been, been uh, the, the idea has been hijacked and has been uh, uh, taken away. And we define our space right now very much based on this territoriality, right? Uh, and commons as a concept of society, as a concept of, uh, of uh, indigenous heritage, is a powerful concept, which means whatever I have, I will give away for the common good, right? And uh, uh, if I go move on to the next one, okay, before, before that, uh, the, the practice of, uh, of commoning, of giving our property, giving our gifts uh, to the good of people, it's a concept of Nusantara, it's a concept of Southeast Asia, right? Uh, um, Kusama has started a, a group, right, where they actually created commons, Kusama there. She actually started the urban farming, urban, urban farming group, where they're actually not just sharing this, the, the information, but they share seeds, they share fruits, they share just about everything, right? Uh, they share the services, uh, and this is the idea of commons, right? So, you, you and what's happening in, in the world today is that the capitalist-led capitalist development concept has removed commons, have privatized space, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and what, what happened here, yes, and this is an example, we'll talk about this one. The idea of property, the paradigm of property uh, is actually assigned, the responsibility is actually assigned to government or the private sector. So the community, uh, this, 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 there's a dis disappearing sense of community responsibility towards the surrounding, towards the land, and towards the environment. This is the responsibility, this is the job of the government, this is the job of the, the private sector, right, the company. So they, they, they do not care that much because they have privatized their responsibility. Right? And this is a, a river in Pulau Pinang, in Penang Island. Right? Um, uh, you can see it's quite dirty. You can actually have uh, cows roaming there, right? Uh, pollution and all that. But what happened is, when the idea of commons have been revived, right? Uh, this is uh, the it, the river has been transformed and became uh, was voted right the cleanest river in Malaysia, and the responsibility was held. The transformation was carried out by the community by the people, not by the government, not by the private sector. Eventually, they came, they came in, right? Politicians and businesses like to come in and help after that. Right? But the power of commons, they actually have little plots and they were assigned for you know, different people of the community. They will, they will farm, they will, they will garden. And, and this is a powerful transformation when you revive a cultural wisdom of commons, right? We return the responsibility uh, we empower the people. So they, and then this river has become a place not just to, for gardening, it's an education place, it's a place for, voluntary, for voluntarism, it becomes a, a CSR project as well. Uh, and if, if you go uh, to this place, it's Sungai Ara in, 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 in Penang, uh, it's a wonderful place to actually, and you can actually uh, 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 eat fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits, organic fruits, right? Uh, from, from the people. So when we rebuild a sharing farm, a common, a concept of common, right? From delinking and connecting to land and earth and nature and green to the ulam, uh, ulama, uh, 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 a family of vegetables in, in Malaysia where you can actually eat raw. Right? Right? You can eat raw, most of them, at least most of them. Right? Uh, so th there's a communities of, uh, uh, of ulamas, of, of, of urban farmers, they're coming together, so some private uh, and consumerist mindset to a sharing culture and sharing system. They actually created a system to share and relieving uh, the, uh, wrong spelling there, relieving local wisdom and reversal of anomaly. We are living in a state of, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, norm, a, normal, a norm system that is very much against our human nature. Our human nature is to share. So the whole idea of collective effort and individualized plots can actually come together. So there's still individual plots, but doing it as, as a collective concept, right? So making income less relevant and to quality of life. So you can actually have quality of life with having you know, uh, you know, uh, 
a big salary so if you continue to have this concept right so that's first the second one is paradigm of knowledge uh, paradigm of knowledge uh, if you look and then it's a simple slide uh, one of the major shifts in in uh, in, the, in the sphere of knowledge is that science has taken over religion okay just let me know science has taken over religion and local wisdom as the god of knowledge right but there are you know different types of knowledge that are still there that are still valuable right uh, this this uh, the, the, this tree this tree is called pohon bring in bring in tree uh, is is uh, is a taboo right it's against the cultural norm to cut the tree uh, uh, what and you might think it is a myth but uh, not many people know where you find this tree you also find water sources underneath the tree so this local wisdom uh, you, need, you need to unearth the under, underlying rationality you know behind local wisdom uh, there's a suku badui it's a tribe in banten state of of of, of indonesia uh, there's an inner suku, in, inner tribe and out, outer tribe they have three types of uh, categories of of, of forest so there's forest that you can actually go in farm and, 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 and you know hunt and gather. There's another forest you can actually uh, some people can go, and there's enough forest no one can go in. So the categorization of forest actually help to preserve the forest. The Bidayo of Sarawak, Bidayo of Sarawak happened to have a, a student of mine who was doing PhD so with me, so he was uh, researching on the Bidayo. The Bidayo of Sarawak has they, they have certain days. Uh, where they, they're prohibited to hunt. Again, it's a way of conservation, right? Uh, and it is embedded in local wisdom. And this is part of our knowledge. It might not seem to be science, but if you look at the rationality, if you look at the reasoning, you look at the, the whole philosophy behind it, it's about conserving, right? Uh, and it's not about consuming so much. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is an example of, of how we can decolonize knowledge, how we can nusantarize in the context, in context of nusantara, right? Uh, the, the third one is a paradigm of development. Uh, if you look at development, the way we define development, right, the way the mainstream discourse defines de development is basically ultra-urbanization, commodification, and accumulation and concentration of wealth. Uh, and and, and uh, we... Uh, when I say ultra urbanization, is this not just you want to urbanize every aspect of the city, you want to expand urban spaces beyond what is given to us. The whole idea of reclamation, and that happens in Penang as well, right? And again, Kusama is one of the activists against <laughs> reclamation. <laughs> She's an activist of all sorts, right? Uh, what happened? The maritime uh, ecological. Uh, uh, support system have been uh, disrupted, right? Uh, in, uh, in our research center, there's a maritime biologist as well. All research has pointed out to this destruction or reduction of biodiversity with uh, reclaimed land, right? So, not just we want to urbanize our own land, we want to expand further land to build urban uh, structures, right? Uh, so, this, why do, you know, this idea of ultra urbanization and then uh, as, as we know, uh, as noted by Prof. Uh, uh, Chai Wat uh, Leon, you know, the idea of commodification, everything is seen from uh, you know, a commodity perspective. How can we turn this into profit? How can we monetize it, right? The beautiful digital word, right? How can we monetize this, right? And then what happened? Uh, we developed, we, we have more urban areas, we have more commodities, but the accumulation and concentration of wealth goes into the very few. And what happens? We have poverty. And one of the problems of uh, deforestation, aside from the big estates, come, are people who are poor who, who need to actually commoditize the forest for the benefit of them elevating themselves out of the poverty. Right? So we have this, this cute idea of development where the we in egalitarian, there's no such English word, but we, we create a, a society that benefits the few. Right? The poor become poorer, the rich become richer. And that's, that we say, well, that's, that's normal. Yeah, that's normal. So it's very materialism centered. Right? Uh, and you see that the, the, the Malaysian urban population is moving from very much 
and the, the, the blue is uh, uh, urban, the green is uh, rural. So it's basically the rural area is transforming the urban. So the urban is where we can see the future and, and doesn't look good. So unleashing the wisdom in us. So I, I'm putting forth the idea of you know, bringing back that shared spaces, the shared prosperity, the, the idea of commons. Uh, another one is the, uh, the, 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 in Islam, this is the idea of halal and toibat. We always hear about the word halal. Halal means uh, per permissible. But toibat is the more important aspect of this whole concept, which means wholesome, goodness. And the concept of halal and toibat was never separated in the Quran. So whenever it's not just permissible, it must be good. The chicken is not, it must be slaughtered in a halal way, but the chicken must not be abused. The chicken should not be caged in, a, in, in an abusive manner. It should, it should not be you know, injected with all kinds of antibiotics and growth hormones, and that is not toiban. Right? And then and, and this concept of, of permissible and good can revive our idea of, uh, 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 of development. Right? And then the Gotong Royong, which is the third one in, in, in the Paradigm of development, and it's a very common idea in, in our villages, yeah. And I argue, probably in, in the whole of uh, Southeast Asia, where we volunteer our effort, and it ha happens very much in the village, but then in urban areas it happens as well, to solve a particular problem, right? They come together to build bridges, right? Uh, who is is very much the idea of you know uh, from each according to ability, right? Uh, kind of a Marxist idea there. So everyone, everyone, everyone contributes the idea to each according to need. Yeah, there's another one. being a sociologist there. Right. Uh, okay, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not profiting. Uh, so the idea of people coming together, sharing their gifts to solve societal problem. Right. So it's about and. And, and I, I talk about re reconnecting with our strengths, our wisdom, relearning from our neighbors. Thailand has a wonderful concept of sufficiency economy, right? So you actually help your, 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 your village only when you have surplus and you go beyond your community. Now here we, we create surplus for people outside of the country, export-oriented, right? But we forget to care for our own selves, our own community, our own village, and the village, the neighboring village, and this is a powerful concept, a transformative concept, is this very much a heritage that we should revive, right? So, it's a reimagination of ethical and spiritual paradigm of development, but I put bracket there, of more stewardship and progress. Perhaps development needs to be re replaced or complemented with either stewardship and progress, right? So, stewardship and progress for society and environment. And if, if you are familiar with the, uh, you know, the Elvin Toffler book of you know, first wave, second wave, third wave, the agri agri agricultural wave, the industrial wave, and information wave, there's a fourth wave, right? What's the fourth wave? The fourth wave is a, is a spiritual, ethical wave, a, a re spiritualization of society where materialism and scientificism will, become, will, will continue to decline. Institutions will move to a, a real responsiveness of global stewardship. Wealth will be redefined, especially as measured in accounting systems. Religion will catch up with science. And if you look at, at how organizations uh, uh, are organizing themselves, so corporates now have two books, the financial report and the sustainability report, right? It's permanent there. And this is where we can advance our causes, the certification game. The, certifi the certifi uh, certifi certification uh, 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 world. So we can come up with different certification. <laughs> Times are okay. Right, right. The last one, right? Uh, and and uh, like fair trade and so. And this is, this is my last slide, right? So on science and religion, religion without science is lame, but science without religion is blind. So in the fourth wave, religion, ethics, morality, values, cultural wisdom will come back to lead science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rivami, for a very rich and pregnant um, discourse on indigenization and decolonization. I have a lot of questions for Dr. Rivami, but definitely I'm sure our audience also have a lot of questions and we will save them for later. Um, so, few key takeaways from the uh, from the presentation of Dr. 
Dr. Ivami, I really appreciated um, how he used commons as actually a verb. The, the shared responsibility of commoning. And I think a lot of countries in Southeast Asia has a challenge in terms of accountability. Um, so now um, we will be welcoming the next uh, speaker. Um, our next speaker, um, he will be talking about um, the Vietnam Community Resources for Climate Resilience, the case of a fishing village community in Vietnam. Um, we, I, we will be welcoming Dr. Wen Vo Huang. He's currently a faculty member and vice dean of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Social Sciences and Humanities, Vietnam National University in Hanoi. Previously, he was with the Institute of Cultural Studies and the Vietnam Museum of Ethnology. His research in urban issues and civil society in Vietnam also appear in State, Society, and the market in, contem in contemporary Vietnam, property, power, and values toward the framework for Vietnamese American studies, history, community, and memory. Um, everybody, let's all share the floor to Dr. Wen Vo Huang. Yes, so good morning to you all. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks Cicha and the Science Society for bringing me here, and thank you for being here for my presentation. So this presentation, I will present my own research for my PhD dissertation about a community in the south of Vietnam and how they deal with the um, aftermath of a typhoon in Vietnam. Uh, as you know that through the last two, two days, uh, you see a lot of uh, disasters and uh, tropical storms and typhoon that affected the livelihood and life of the people in Southeast Asia. So this paper will contribute an angle from the point of view of uh, a Vietnamese uh, people, Vietnamese community. So the content of my paper, I will first present to you some impact of climate change in Vietnam because uh, I think for the last two days you hear a lot of the impact to the Philippines, to Malaysia, Indonesia, but about Vietnam, I think uh, this paper will provide you a background to see how the climate change impacts the community in Vietnam. The second one I will present to you the case study of a Catholic fishing community in Vietnam. It is a, a very special community um, that, uh, that, can, that you can look at the community to see the inside internal resources and intra resources community I will discuss later. And then I will present the case of the landfall of Durian Typhoon in 2006. I think yesterday uh, some groups already present a typhoon on uh, Haiyan Typhoon, Typhoon, and also called Yolanda, but I think Durian Typhoon is also uh, significant uh, impact. Uh, and then I will present insight in community resources for recovery and intra-community resources for recovery. And finally, I will present some implication on cultural her heritage with uh, climate change. So the impact of climate change in Vietnam, um, according to some uh, literature review, we know that Yes, Vietnam is one of the countries that affected mostly by climate change. And from 1997 to 2016, Vietnam was the fifth country with climate risk index in 2018. And inclement or extreme weather events increased on rate and unpredictable. Uh, the rain river increased uh, from 270 millimeters per month in the period from 1901 to 1930 increased to 281 millimeter per month from the period from 1991 to 2015. The temperature also increased greatly. You can see it increased from the 27 degrees Celsius in the period of the beginning of the 20th century to 27.5 degrees Celsius in the period from 1991 to 2015. Even Hanoi's temperature in 2018, it was 42 degrees Celsius. It was extremely hot. It is comparable to the situation in Thailand in the summer, I think. Uh, and in 2011, uh, 2017, it was a record with um, 16 tropical storms and floods that hit Vietnam. The sea level increase is also a significant concern of Vietnam. Uh, it increased from the 2 point uh, 4.5 millimeters per year in the period from 1960 to 2014, increased to 
3.3 millimeters per year for the period from uh, 1993 to 2014. So we see that it increased the temperature, increased the land rain level, and increased the sea level. So I think all of them can make the change for the Vietnamese situation. So as you know about Vietnam, Vietnam is a country with a long seaside, with a 3,260 kilometer seaside, and it is a long country, so easily to be affected by sea level increase. According to the Intergovernment uh, Panel for, on Climate Change, IPCC, uh, when the sea level rise to 100 centimeters, the loss of the land in Vietnam will be 40,000 square kilometers, approximately to 12% uh, of land area of Vietnam and leading to 17 million people will lose their livelihood and approximately 23% of the population. At the Mekong River Delta, the large rice field in Vietnam will be affected the most and it also leads to the problem of food security in Vietnam because Vietnam is one of the five largest countries that produce rice in the world. And it would bring effect to many areas of economy, uh, society, life, and healthcare of many communities living in Vietnam. The death toll of Vietnam due to extreme weather events was very high in 2018. Uh, it is ranked as 11th country in global. So the question that my paper raised uh, was that, um, uh, what was the real effect of a tropical storm to a community in the coastal area of Vietnam? What was the involvement of the government? How have the community get recovered? What was the strategy of local community to respond to the storm aftermath? So these four questions will be addressed in the next um, session. So about the community that I study, it is a community that uh, located in the south of Vietnam. It, um, but the community is originally come from the north Vietnam, uh, as you know, the they are Catholic, and the Catholic in Vietnam has a long story of um, uh, um, mission that come from the missionary from Portugal and France, and they came to Vietnam in the 16th century, and they came to Nam Dinh province, and then the, and they, uh, the missionary spread the Catholicism into the people living in the um, coastal provinces of Vietnam, such as Nam Dinh or Ninh Bình, and this um, community became uh, the first um, Catholic community in Vietnam. It is called uh, Bu Chu uh, Diocese. Uh, and in the, uh, 1954, uh, after Geneva Accord, this, um, this community migrated to the south of Vietnam according to the Geneva Accord. Uh, and uh, it divided Vietnam into two parts. The first, uh, the, the northern part belonged to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and the second part belonged to the Republic of Vietnam until 1975. So these people can freely move from the north to the south uh, within 300, 300 days. Yes, uh, and you can see uh, this is the images uh, from the internet about the migration from the north to the south of these people. And in coming to the south, they were settled in uh, yes, they were settled in uh, the south of Vietnam. First, they arrived in Saigon, and then and then they were resettled in Phuc Tinh, uh, in Phuc Tinh commune. It is located in. Uh, um, Phuc Thuy provinces in the past and now now it's called Barrio Vũng Tàu. Okay. Yes, uh, originally from Nam Định and migrated and settled in Phuc Tinh Commune, and it became the so-called village of millionaires before 1975, because it, they come to the south of Vietnam and they continue practice fishing, as they um, practiced fish, fishing in the north of Vietnam. But in the south, with the uh, engine boat, they can uh, fishing more effectively, and many of them became millionaires, and this village is very well known in the south of Vietnam. So after 1975, uh, the unification of Vietnam, many, many of them left Vietnam for the Western countries, such as in Canada, in the US, uh, or the Australia. And the um, remainder who stayed in the homeland continue to maintain fishing as one of the main livelihood and give faith on Catholicism. 
Yes, and my paper will use the concept of diaspora to analyze the situation and the relationship between the people in the homeland and the people who live abroad. And we and I I, I use the modern definition that Schaeffer used you know, diaspora as an ethnic minority groups, migrant origin, residing and acting in host country, but maintaining strong sentimental and material links with their country of origin or homeland. And then um, William Safran and Robin Cohen also provide a list of diaspora. So um, the list of diaspora, can you can see as the dispersion from a homeland to a more um, foreign region. And then the whole collective memory and myth of the homeland, including its location, history, and achievement, and the development of a return movement that gains collective population. Uh, and such and such, you have you can see nine features of diaspora, and we can I apply the, this concept to to see the relationship between the Vietnamese community abroad and the and the homeland community in a um, disaster recovery process to see how they can help each other in the recovery process. And the implication of diaspora concept, you can see the relationship uh, between the homeland and diaspora never disrupted. Although they live abroad, but they maintain relationship with their family. So the fami familiar relationship and the relationship with their, their Catholic parish in Vietnam is maintained through the space, through the time, and it increased the communication uh, with the homeland and the communication increased help solidify the sense of diaspora because people can understand their situation and um, solidify the sense of diaspora and bring them together in helping the, the homeland community. And this um, diaspora is important for the Vietnamese community because uh, while the Vietnamese government wants to embrace the diaspora and welcoming the overseas Vietnamese to return to Vietnam and invest in the investment in the entrepreneurship or, or um, and engage in any economic activities. But the deterritorialization policy seems not to be effective in the, for the people in the diaspora because of the tension between the people who left Vietnam because of political issue, political sensitive, and it creates a gap between the government and overseas Vietnamese. But uh, it is with the com Vietnamese government, but uh, with the community, with the Catholic community, and the community symbol and the heritage of the community as a Catholic people, as the people of the Catholic Church become a means that connect the homeland community with the diaspora. Yeah, these are some images of people who left Vietnam after 1975. And also they live abroad and they evacuate after 1975, but they maintain the relationship with the family, relationship with the Catholic parish, and they also send remittances to their home uh, to help their family at home overcome the hardship of the common economy from the 1976 to the 1986, before the period. So what is about the typhoon? In 2006, um, you can see the route of the Durian Typhoon. It starts from the Pacific Ocean. It goes through the Philippines and creates a death toll of more than 200 people in the Philippines and continue to enter the Sea of Vietnam and then uh, it hit Vietnam. But you see that the route is very um, Mm, very, very uh, unpredictable because first of all it goes straight and then all of the um, weather um, uh, analysis analyzer they thought that the um, uh, route it, it would come to the center of Vietnam and hit Bing Thuat but uh, uh, towards the end the, the route of the of Durian Typhoon it go south southern part of Vietnam and hit Vũng Tàu and hit the south in and hit the Mekong Delta region so this route uh, make the weather analysis and the policy maker was shocked because they didn't uh, didn't thought that um, this typhoon will hit the south of Vietnam and none of the provinces were prepared for to receive this typhoon so the, this community was really severely affected by the typhoon and the landfall it is landfall on the December of 2026 uh, 2006 and it uh, make the damages to the southern province of Vietnam. The death toll was 98 people and more than 31 missing people, 1,770 wounded, 3,000 houses collapsed and 180 house roof was blown off, 700 fishing boats sunk. 
So in the aftermath, the government provides emergency aid for the affected people, such as water and instant noodles, and final financial art at approximately to 20,000 US dollars from the farther front of Vietnam for Barrio Vũng Tàu province. I think this amount, it looks a bit um, uh, large compared to the GDP of Vietnam, but it is very small compared to the damages that uh, the, the typhoon made for the area. So nothing was provided for the re restoring religious institutions. It only provides some um, instant help for the local people to overcome in the first day. And parishioners suffered from praying outside, uh, and also some of them go to the neighboring church to pray together with um, other people in, uh, in neighboring parish. So you can see some images of Barry Bungto damages. You see a boat sunk and the community was collapsed, the tree fell down after the storm. So um, because the church, was, um, the church was collapsed, so they have to find community resources to recover the church in order to continue their faith and in order to continue to practice their religion. So the council of the, of the parish meet, organize a lot of meeting on uh, talking, discussing about how to um, rebuild the church or to repair the church and analyze the situation of the church. And finally, all of them think that um, they should rebuild the church as it was built in 1964. It was a long time ago. And uh, it required each community to contribute uh, 2 million Vietnam Dong, about $100 on each household. Although it looks a um, small amount of money, but compared to the livelihood of the people or the fishing, it, um, it, is, uh, it was a lot of money because um, the people themselves also uh, have to, to do fishing every day to cover their livelihood. And, uh, and, and some of the former Paris uh, head told me that uh, it was not worth much, the need of money, because there were families that did not contribute anything. And uh, a, fire, an, a vice pastor of the parish told me that the people were affected by the storm uh, as well, so they don't have much money to contribute to rebuild the church. And these are the structure of, the, of a Catholic parish in Vietnam. You can see the archdiocese, the diocese, and the main uh, issue that happened is with the parish, parish priest and parish council head are the people, are the institution that help uh, um, discussing and connecting and helping this recovery period. Intra-community resources. Uh, yes, after 1975, um, some people left, uh, many people left Vietnam and then they continued their relationship uh, with, the, uh, with Vietnam and therefore the, the council asked each family um, household in the parish to connect their family members abroad, living abroad, to contribute the money to help uh, to rebuild the parish. And it's um, fortunately that after 31 years, uh, many people living abroad still hold a, a connection, a, a, still hold a strong connection with the home parish, and then they can organize a trip for a pastor to visit the country in the U.S. and in Canada and in Australia to um, organize fundraising conference to help the church in Vietnam, and uh, in the and six months after. After the um, disaster, the um, pastor, uh, the vice pastor, can go to Australia to start a first trip in June 2007, and then another trip to G the United States in November 2007. And Father Hui told me that um, he contacted uh, overseas Vietnamese through local parishioners because only relatives knew how to contact their overseas relative, and he went without knowing the people who would pick him up and he brought the picture of them with him and after he arrived at the airport some of the people come to him and uh, ask him and he get to know them for the first time so the church uh, the new church was completed in 2009 and father we let me know that um, although the estimated amount of the church was four billion vietnam dong the final expense was a bit higher so the case suggests that the people living abroad maintained relationship with their close relative in Vietnam, and in 2006, 4 billion Vietnam dong approximately equal 260,000 US dollars. And this is the 
uh, image of the church after it was rebuilt. And you can see it is very equal, eco-friendly. It doesn't use um, air conditioning, air conditioner, and then uh, it open and it used uh, local um, knowledge to you to make take, make use of the wind and make use of the sun in the local area. Yes, and lesson for climate change. Uh, Overseas Vietnamese, as you can see in this case, have maintained long-distance relationship with the homeland and with the Catholic home parish in Vietnam. It is the transnational good that help their relatives maintaining Vietnam to overcome the hardship of the common economy in the period from, from 1976 to 1986. And besides the relative living in Vietnam, the home parish are the places for the people in the diaspora to share the collective memory you see that uh, without being a, a Catholic member, uh, despite away, being away for 30 years, they still hold their uh, sentiments with their religion at home and with, and with their family at home. So therefore, they can contribute a majority of the budget for the reconstruction of the church. And you can see in this case, the government can only help, uh, only have mildly in the in in the um, emergency aid after the storm only. But the institution, the religious institution, the of the local community, they are the main resources that help uh, the community recover and help their um, keep their faith and continue to practice their, their religion. In the meantime, the paper will suggest that while the local community may have their own strategy and resources to deal with climate change, natural disaster, uh, so the gov local government and the uh, central government needs to co cooperate, collaborate closely with the people to advance traditional social structure for a more resilient cap capability. And they also have to advance and improve the disaster alert system more accurate prediction. So that is the case of the Vietnamese community and I um, can share with you and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang, for a very insightful presentation. Um, I believe, and I'm sure we would all agree, that um, the case of Vietnam is a very um, strong case of, um, of how it actually epitomizes um, the strength of community resilience through diaspora and also um, through the strong kinship that was, able, that was influenced by religion. Um, so now for the last presentation for this panel, um, it will be presented by Dr. Pasuk Pong Pai, Pong Pai Chit. She will be presenting about a macro perspective on traditional political social heritage and climate resilience based on two case studies from Thailand. Dr. Pasuk is the Emeritus Professor in Political Economy at the Faculty of Economics in Chulalongkorn University. Her latest publication is based on research results entitled Land Governance in Thailand. Her presentation is going to be assisted by Dr. Chris Baker. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you very much. And this is a joint presentation with uh, uh, Dr. Chris. Uh -huh. And he had helped me enormously in uh, preparing uh, this paper and in uh, uh, the, uh, the, the PowerPoints. Actually, what I'm talking about today is based on my research with a team of about 20 people. But these are only two case studies. I just discovered later that uh, uh, the, the study that I have been doing is actually a very similar topic to uh, the seizure. This I, was, I found out later. Okay. Um, I want to look at the potential of traditional social or political heritage to build resilience uh, to climate change from a more a macro perspective. I will concentrate on Thailand and look at two different instances. First, urban heat and elite power. All around the world, the increase in extreme weather and the shift in weather patterns is moving people from place to place to relocate, to migrate. Persistent drought has a role in the migrations 
from Central America to the U.S. southern border, as we know, and from the Middle East to Europe. One aspect of these migrations is that we cannot separate out the role of climate change. Poverty and politics also play a part. In Thailand and elsewhere in our region, the monsoon is changing, the temperature is trending up, the rainfall down, subjecting farmers to more droughts, and rainfall is becoming more erratic. And when it does, and when it does rain, it can be far too much, as we all know. The example is what happened in Australia and elsewhere, also including in Thailand recently. Every year, some marginal farmers can no longer survive on the land as before. Some migrate to other areas who find jobs overseas, but most do not have these options. So they move to the city to find work. Growth of the cities is contributing to the heat island effects. Bangkok is now five to seven degrees hotter than the surrounding area. This is the latest, the latest uh, research results. Traffic air, traffic, air conditioning, concrete, and the lack of greenery contribute to this very much. The policies needed is quite simple. Control on the traffic, better urban architecture, more greenery, and so on. There are NGOs pushing for all these reforms for many, many years, but nothing really happens. The simple reason is that politics is controlled by a small group of elite, and especially by big business interests. These peoples are also impacted by the deterioration of the urban environment, but they oppose the needed reforms and instead use their money and power to defend themselves and often push for short-run high economic growth to keep the stock market booming to satisfy a handful of Thai and international financiers, no matter at whatever environmental costs or loss of livelihood for the poor. I must say I'm not against economic growth as such as an economist. But experiences of more developed countries show that a stable and even economic growth rate, which may be as low as 1 to 2 percent or 2 to 4, 2 to 3 percent a year, but occurs evenly a long period of time up to 10, 20, 30 years with no disruptions from political crisis and malmanagement of the global economy are more desirable for achieving sustainable and peaceful society. And this is the experience of the developed countries in uh, Europe and in the US in the past. The question is, can traditional political and social elites be mobilized to support policies for climate resilience? So far, there has been no sign here in this country. The traditional political elite, royalty and all aristocracy has tended to be incorporated into the modern urban elite. The traditional religious establishment, the Buddhist Sangha, has produced thinkers who have articulated many good ideas about the economy and the environment. These are important as individuals, but the Buddhist Sangha as an institution has been carefully isolated from politics. I would be interested to hear whether similar traditional elites have been effective on such issues elsewhere in the region. Now, I go to the second case, his and political action coalition. My second example is a little bit more optimistic. As elsewhere, we have a big problem of haste, of rising levels of PM2.5 air pollution, especially in this season, and especially in the northern city of Chiang Mai. I myself have been affected 
by this PM 2.5 very much by being in Bangkok. One of the contributing factors to the PM 2.5 haze is forest fires, both natural and man-made, with some coming from Indonesia and from Myanmar and elsewhere, as well as locally from time to time. As a result, this issue of urban air pollution became connected with the issue of managing forests. The haze show that the issues of forests could not be separated from the issue of forest communities. The issue of forest communities could not be separated from the issue of livelihood of the little people in the forest. The issue of livelihood could not be separated from the issue of sustainability of both people and the trees. Unfortunately, the government is more interested in the in the uh, the trees to survival of the trees rather than the people here. As a Jan Chi of Subichan yesterday described, the Thai authorities believe that forest dwellers like the Karen are destroyer of the forest, while the Karen themselves claim to have the expertise and motivation to protect the forests. There are proofs for this. I have been told by an ex-general in the Thai army who is interested in forest issues and is a humanist. He told me that we have to thank you, the Karen, in this country, who have helped protect forests in the north and the northwestern part of the country, as she also showed in his map the day before yesterday. Coming back to the haze problems, a few years ago, the air pollution in Chiang Mai became so bad that it affects the health of many people in the city and badly damaged the tourist industry. As a result, a big coalition formed, including NGOs and activists, doctors and public health specialists, Buddhist monks, middle class pressure groups, and business associations who are affected by the decline in the tourist industry. They pressed the government authorities to cooperate with the ethnic community groups living in the forest near the city. They helped to negotiate an agreement under which the forest communities would help to reduce the amount of forest fires. In return, the forest communities would gets concession on land and resident rights. This actually happened in, uh, in the Majam area, just above uh, Chiang Mai. For some time, this became effective. It was a win-win situation for all sides. However, since then, it has not gone so well, largely because all ideas and prejudice are difficult to change and lobbyists with all ideas are very powerful. They don't like this way of allowing people to live in the forests. They want the forest to be completely um, rid of people. But I want to emphasize the learnings from this agreement. In contrast to my first heat island example, there were important policy changes made. I think the reason for this was that a broad coalition was formed that included both modern and traditional elites, alongside groups like the forest communities, which are usually denied a role in policy making. This is a very special case. The fight is still going on right now. To put it another way, Democratic process matters. So, my last message, the protests among the young people demanding reform for more democratic institutions that are going on right now should certainly be ardently supported also. Thank you. And thank you very much, Ajahn Kreis.
Thank you very much, Dr. Pasok, for your valuable insights. I would definitely agree that um, democratic process really matters, specifically here in Southeast Asia. And the movement and the reforms that are being initiated by young people should truly be supported. Um, I believe that these are wonderful opening lines to actually steer um, our conversation this morning. Um, and with that, um, we are opening the floor for your questions. Um, comments and reflections as well. Um, we will begin with the presentation of um, Dr. Rivami. So if you have questions, um, we will be recognizing you. Yes. Okay. So let's start with um, um, Sir Leo from the back. Yes. The hello, 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 hello. Uh, uh, the process of decolonization is never perfect, and it's always continuing. Right? I think um, there's a risk. Like I just like to cite what's happened in the Philippines that uh, turning, I mean, decolonizing and uh, casting maybe opening narratives to other sources of. Uh, of historical knowledge and archaeological knowledge uh, is, is important. But recently in the Philippines, what's, what's happened is this, you know, by, by draining out colonial records and knowledge and casting doubt on them as part of the decolonization process, it's, it leaves a vacuum that can be filled by fake news and fake facts. And one of these uh, uh, funny little myths that was propagated during the last election is the myth of uh, the Maharlika, uh, which is supposed to be a uh, long forgotten kingdom in the Philippines. I think it's partly based on the Nusantara tradition, the pre-colonial uh, island spanning uh, kingdom of, of uh, Southeast Asia. Now, the part of that myth is also the myth of this Italiano gold, which is supposed to be distributed by the winning administration, since it's now open open game to talk about politics, <laughs> so I'm just bringing it up. But anyway, I think that's the problem, in, especially in the Philippines, where in our pre-colonial records aren't so well established, that decolonizing leaves us with a vacuum that's hard to fill uh, in the absence of very prolific scholarship and knowledge production. So how do we avoid or how do we cautiously fill in this, this void that's created by decolonization in the absence of a, of a reliable record. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Leo. Um, would you like to respond, Dr. Rivami, or should we take in more questions for, from, from the audience? Okay, so please, please respond. Thank you very much. More. Right, all right, okay. That is a very important question you have there, right? Um, and and uh, where do we start? Uh, especially if we do not have uh, knowledge about you know, economy, knowledge about politics, right? Is there another word than democracy? Do we have another word than democracy? Should we create another system of politics, of governance? You know? Do we have to call our country a democratic, whatever, whatever, or republic, whatever, whatever, whatever? Right? Because these are all, uh, you know, uh, a Greek or a Roman, or whatever, uh, very European-centric concepts, right? Um, I, I think I, I did note at the beginning that there's a a proverb in, in Bahasa in, 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 in the Malay world, in Nusantara, uh, ambil, ambil yang jernih buang yang keroh, yeah? take the, the pure and remove the impurities. So it's, it is not to, uh, to debunk any, all concepts that are colonial. I mean, there are good concepts that we can uh, uh, and, uh, build on, right? Uh, that said, um, uh, my, my assertion, my, my contention is that um, we do not want to say that uh, we do not have a, uh, have, a, have a system of knowledge because we are weak, right? And uh, often 
my friends from Indonesia say, well, you, you, you guys are lucky you have British as your colonizers. Right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think a rapist is a rapist, right? <laughs> whatever, whatever we call it. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in, in our history, we have very established empires, very established civilization, right? Uh, but our, our system of knowledge has been truncated by colonization. Right? Uh, so we, we need to have the right attitude in, in decolonizing our paradigms of life and environment and, and, and uh, 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 development. So my argument is that we want to make sure that we do not uh, you know, remove everything that's colonial. We need to recognize there are things that are positive as well. But at the same time, um, we do not want to you know, give too much credit to the colonial powers because they have built schools and hospitals and roads and dams and canals. You know? uh, you know? So that, that is my argument. That's that, yes, I agree with you on that part. We must be careful uh, uh, and, and having the right attitude. And, and decolonizing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ivami. Now I will be taking a question from a young person. Um, let me recognize June for his question. So I'll be out alternating it from a young per from a young at heart and a young person. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, with. The whole idea of Nusantarization or the slowly, the slow move away from colonialism. I'm I'm a bit skeptical about this whole idea. It's because the the examples that you quoted, the Bidayu and also from Yogyakarta. Yogyakarta has a bit more uh, Hindu influence in terms of the culture, right? And then Bidayu is completely a non-Malay. Uh, non-Malay kind of community or tradition or culture. So um, the question is more of um, there, there, there is this also sense of threat from the indigenous people within Sabah and Sarawak which what, which what we notice is that um, the Nusantarization can also be in a sense Islamization, Islamization right? So you do see that with Islamization, there is, after two generations, there is a complete loss of culture uh, or, or the, the, what's it called? Uh, yeah, traditions. Uh, for, example, for instance, just a very simple one is like the main difference, right? Once, uh, especially in Malaysia, you see that uh, you have, uh, usually they have a Christian name after you convert you become Bin or Binti or Noor or Muhammad something. So it, 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 for me, I think that uh, the examples you're, you're quoting is not really true Malay way of doing stuff, right? True Malay, you're not quoting the Sultanate of Pahang, the Sultanate of uh, Johor. Um, yeah, and also the, the, the one example you said about the university right is it just a very nice way to package feudalism because it is feudalism right in in a sense you're using what the royalty is giving you and you're respecting it so is is that i mean are we just repackaging something to sound nice in a paper when when i'm i'm, I'm, re I'm really just kind of seeing what your view is on on a, like another point of view Dr. Ivani. Thank you. I have a Filipino friend. Right? His, her name is Mina. It's a friend of my friend, the wife of my friend. She's a Malay. She's a Catholic. So, uh, Nusantarization doesn't mean Malaysian, Malay, 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 it cannot be Malaysianization, right? It's not making it Malay. So, Bedayu is part of Nusantara, but the Badui, who are not Muslims, they are part of Nusantara. So, Nusantara is about reviving, I, 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 I posit the idea of Nusantarization is reviving the indigenous um, heritage of the people. So it could be, it could be Hindus, it could be Muslims, it could be Buddhists, uh, the, the, the center of Buddhist 
uh, scholars at one point was in Srivijaya, which is in southern southern part of Sumatra. So, uh, and if you look at the oldest monument in Southeast Asia, which is in Sungai Batu, it is a, it's a monument that predates Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and Hinduism. My counterpoint is that, the, yes, we can quote history, but with the evolution of time, it, it, it's no longer about protecting indigenous or, or minority. It's now um, the majority narrative, right? With the Bumiputra uh, kind of idea, Ketuanan Melayu, right? Ketuanan Melayu, what does that even mean? Ketuanan Melayu, that, that is a very in, ingrained kind of mm. cultural idea that we, we are not talking about. Like uh, I, I am sure a few of uh, our Orang or uh, uh, members here can attest to that, right? It's it's the Ketuanan Melayu that is giving out the rights to log. It's the Ketuanan Melayu that is giving out the rights to mine, right? It's the there are special concessions that. Um, Okay, my face is not on camera. So there, there, there is a, uh, there, there are special concessions that the royalty can get, right? And and that is the majority narrative that uh, that this whole idea of Nusantara, because that is the majority narrative, right? Of of Ketuanan, uh, like still the same thing with its feudalism. If you have to uh, pay respects to the uh, whatever Sultan of Yogyakarta to get kept the uh, university and the university itself doesn't have a land title or whatever so it's the same thing that the orang nasties are, are facing right they, they stay in the forest for thousands of years you just have to give a chop mohor and then you can get the nice timber rights concession this and that okay. uh, yeah, that's my idea because it, it seems that it's a bit skewed towards a very romanticized version of what it means to be uh, whatever Malay or Nusantara, when you're not talking ab about the 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 real issue at hand, which is the the yeah majority narrative. Eh? Majority narrative might not be right, and that's what I'm arguing. Actually, I'm arguing that Nusantarization is actually putting back ethics, putting back indigenous wisdom back into the the whole discourse. Actually. Probably you're arguing with somebody else, not arguing with me. <laughs> I'm actually with you on this one, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not for feudalism. I'm not for, I'm not for capitalism for that matter. I think it's quite obvious what I, I've proposed to you there. So uh, uh, the example of the Jogjakarta thing is that um, the idea of sharing your properties, you know, the sharing, that's the idea. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, glorifying the idea of the, the Sultanate of Yogyakarta and all that. I'm not saying that, I'm saying that the idea of commons, the idea of creating uh, share, shared spaces and shared, shared property. Right? I, I think I, I agree with you, but then you, we are actually arguing against somebody else. Yeah? You're not arguing with me, with me right now. Right? <laughs> I'm promoting indigenization. I'm giving Sarawak example as a supreme example of uh, uh, conservation of heritage and environment there. Right? Uh, Perhaps you can, yeah. It's great to know that both of you are on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me recognize Kun Jim. Thank you. In um, earlier presentations, we've heard about uh, communities in Southeast Asia that have uh, preserved to this day the indigenous traditions that uh, involve sharing uh, between the members of the communities and spiritual relationships with the natural environment. And uh, now in panel five, uh, we're coming up against reality. Uh, Dr. Nguyen said, okay, in the uh, Vietnamese uh, fishing, Catholic fishing community, the people did the right thing, but the go local government has to then uh, follow on beyond that, and I gather they have not done that. Um, in Ajahn Pasuk's uh, presentation, we saw that the problem was that elite has captured both the state and the economy, 
and is not operating in the sort of epistemology that we would like to see that we think can solve the climate uh, uh, change problem. So my question for you, Dr. Mohammed, is has, have we come up with some specific ideas on how we can affect this change in epistemology which is needed in all of these countries, and uh, including Thailand, whether they were colonized or not. Uh, a, a, um, a anthropologist, Dr. Michael Hertzfeld, has coined the term for Thailand crypto-colonialism, because whether the foreigners came in and actually ruled the country through a colonial system or not, the elites in non-colonized countries adopted the epistemologies you're talking about. So how do we take those epistemologies from earlier traditions? What are the practical steps that you see can happen? Um, you talked about religion, and I was very heart heartened by Dr. Fakhrudin's uh, presentation yesterday, where he pointed out there are green mosques in uh, Indonesia, and there are various organizations of Muslim communities that are pushing forward these ideas, but as uh, Ajahn Pasuk uh, said, the Buddhist church, as a church here in Thailand, has not been doing that, despite the inspiring words we had from Venerable Anil yesterday. So where can we find a roadmap for how to move forward on this? Well, that's, that's a very, 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 it, it, the most relevant question, actually, I think, to, to what I'm, I was talking about. Uh, I'm, I'm very... Um, uh, humble, I think. I, I learned a lot from this uh, conference. Uh, I, I think where we can begin, uh, at least in my capacity as an academic in university, uh, is uh, is in the uh, in the in the realm of, of knowledge. And example, the first day, I think, uh, Dr. J was talking from from Sarawak, was talking about the the, the Mihao and the Molong about you know taking care of the environment and then when you claim an area you can share the area you know you have the stewardship concept right and and that concepts were actually incorporated into the the bible uh for for the for the indigenous people i think we need to rethink a similar concept our concept our constructs our own language perhaps yeah uh, that can be complemented and sometimes replaced uh, the, the, the concepts or constructs in, in our mainstream uh, uh, discourse in all the disciplines. And, uh, and I, I'm in the social sciences. I think one of the most destructive institutions of the, of, 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 of the university is the social sciences because we are promoting you know, the, you know, the, the Keynesian economics, the, the, uh, the, uh, the political system that's very much colonial, com almost completely colonial. So I think that's one realm, that's one space that we can do. The other one is, of course, through the, to conferences. And perhaps one of the things we could do together is collect all this local wisdom, all these ideas, right, uh, constructs uh, of uh, you know, how to take care of environment using our own uh, ideas and conceptualization. I mean, like it's sufficiency economy, right? I think that was, that's a very powerful transformative idea in, for, to transform economy. I, I think that's where, where we start having conversation, conferences, s seminars, workshops. Uh, but at the same time, textbooks, the last frontier, I think. Uh, textbooks meaning from primary school to secondary school, high school, right? up to university and, and because we have all, so, so many concepts that are coming from the colonial uh, past and, and colonizing our, our, our knowledge. Right? And uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's where we be, if you're talking about knowledge per se. Right? So, um, I, 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 by the way, for, for the Philippines, rethinking about the word Mahalika, yeah, I think that's a, it might not be a, the right word, but it's a good word to trigger the conversation, to rethink about the colonial past, uh, whether the Philippines should actually uphold the idea of, you know, uh, the Philippines, the, 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 the King Philippines, right? King Philips, right? Right. So, as uh, you trigger that past, right? Doctor Pasuk, would you also like to respond? Uh, um, I. Maybe I leave it later. 
ask first okay, and okay. first. Okay, um, let me recognize um, Ms. Kusama. Thank you. Uh, I was struck by your title. I think something elite and heat. What was it again? <laughs> elite. Uh, elite. You know, the title that you showed on the slide, elite something and heat something. Oh, but, um, urban heat and elite. Urban heat and elite. And elite. elite. Okay, urban heat and elite. I think it, it really kind of uh, gives a visual picture of uh, who is responsible, right? Urban elite is elite power. Urban heat and, and elite, elite power. power. The elite power is uh, responsible for creating all this uh, climate imbalance. And there is um, sort of new words being reinvented all the time, but one of them which is very powerful is climate justice. You know, because the polluters are not paying, they want to carry on business as usual. And the people who have to pay are the people who are suffering from droughts and uh, typhoons. You know, so the, it is the people who did not contribute to the climate problem that is paying with their lives. So climate justice, there's a, also a new term, uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Uh, and and some some are good terms, some are some something you can think about, but some are not so good. Like you know, carbon net zero, which is really meaningless because you are creating net zero here and you are transferring, you are offsetting, you are creating problems elsewhere by 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 saying that this is net zero, but you have actually created external ex externalities. So a lot of the development that you see now is actually creating externalities. It's creating problems elsewhere. So, uh, and especially the most, you know, uh, net zero greenwash kind of development. So, the, well, what, uh, what you have said is actually, um, it, is not, it is not so much about, I mean, yes, there are problems that, that are injustices or cl climate injustice globally, but there's also climate just injustice locally. And you have presented it so well that it is actually locally, we have not been able to tackle the problem locally, and, and the, the, the entire uh, global problem is just a, a kind of a sum of all the problems that have been uh, produced locally be because of elite power, uh, broken politics locally that have uh, um, been reproduced in every, every nation state, actually, in every nation state, and uh, and the elite, rather than responding to the local people, have been actually captured by the global elite. Uh, and the institutions, the politicians, the, um, the, the, the nation states have been already captured uh, to the advantage of the global elite. So how do you see that transmitting you know, from the global to the national to the local arena? Well, you see, I'm grappling, uh, listening today, I'm grappling with this idea that, okay, uh, like uh, our first speaker focused on colonial heritage. But in fact, if you think, you think, well, Thailand, uh, we, we don't have that kind of uh, feeling so strongly. Um, I think, and yet, uh, with the uh, globalization, and development. Um, uh, ev every country in the world are creating a global elite, have created a global elite uh, that think like uh, the people in the US and the people, some people in, um, in other developed countries and who, who do not believe in climate change and uh, only wishing uh, to keep growth growing and keep um, so I mean um, I would take a different kind of uh, approach um, uh, and it's very nice of you to to show this that uh, it, it's very well for each country to struggle but this is really a, 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 a collective action it's, it's a question of quality action, and, that's, and, and what we see in COP in various uh, uh, meetings each year. 
uh, the progress is very slow. And uh, so, you know, like, uh, it, your country also has a global elite, Thailand, everybody has a global elite that think at a different plane. And, uh, and, and that's why we, we, we cannot just operate at the Southeast Asia level. And I'm very happy that uh, um, some of what's going on today uh, at this meeting will be presented next year in COP, at COP next year, so that we will have a presence uh, internationally and show our solidarity. So thank you for organizing this seminar. I think it's very fruitful as a beginning. So far, you see, Asia has been very uh, inactive in this area. And I'm very happy to see that Siam Society, in the Siam Society, Thailand could make, uh, you know, could play a role with uh, our Southeast Asian members. Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Dr. Pasok. I would like to recognize the gentleman wearing a fedora hat, please. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Imtiaz Mukbul from Travel Impact Newswire. Uh, this question is for Dr. Pasok and Dr. Mohammed. Uh, the, uh, there is a document known as the ASEAN Sociocultural Blueprint, which has been signed off by the heads of state of ASEAN as a legally uh, as a legal document, an inter a treaty of some kind. Uh, this actually gives uh, NGOs, activists, media, rank and file people a legal backing to protest and demand checks and balances and accountability because it's a document that has been signed off by the heads of state. Uh, it's called the ASEAN Sociocultural Blueprint, which I'm sure you've heard of, and it directly relates to the title of this conference which is cultural wisdom. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, why is it that this document does not actually come up? Uh, because it gives you a very strong legal mandate to fight back against some of these injustices and wrongdoings uh, perpetuated by the elites themselves, which Dr. Pasuk, as Dr. Pasuk pointed out, um, they become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So I'm just wondering, there seems to be a bit of a, uh, uh, a, a gap here which can be filled because we have the legal mandate to do it. Uh, isn't it possible to bring that more to the forefront and do some table thumping that heads of state who have signed off on that document have got the moral and political responsibility to walk the talk? There's a question there somewhere, but I'm sure you get it. Um, who would like to respond first, Dr. Pasok or Dr. Ivami? Uh, uh, that, that I, I agree with you. I think something like that should be uh, brought to the front uh, uh, in, in, in our discussion of culture, uh, especially we're talking about Southeast Asia, right? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, what happened is that each of us is um, focusing mainly on our area that we kind of forget that there's to refer to a, uh, an important piece of document that you are, uh, that that can actually bring us together right so thank you very much i think that's that would be my my, my thought about why it wasn't brought to our discussion yeah um my you, you know that uh southeast asia asean as an institution has been has been a disappointment hasn't it we must, we, must, we must admit that uh, this Southeast Asian thing has been a, a disappointment. For, for a start, it, it, was, uh, it was created, uh, pushed by outsider uh, for, for various um, um, ob objectives, which may not be local, but you know, international. And uh, the political problems uh, in Southeast Asia uh, for growing too fast and, and moving too fast um, have left us with this uh, heritage of uh, political instability, I think. 
and and uh, the I I have no answer to this, and in a way, uh, all of us are responsible. I haven't been paying much attention to the the ASEAN as an institution at all, because I think it's uh, it's not my area of expertise, and perhaps. Um, this is one area where if you have the next meeting, you, you've got to incorporate some of the guys from the, the institution, uh, ASEAN institution to come, and, to come and listen to us as well and uh, try to push them. Yeah? And it's not a fault of any one particular country. It's just, it's just happening. Uh, we are not good at uh, this kind of this kind of thing. Head of state like to sign all kind of things so that they will be, they will appear in the, you know, media that they are signing something, but how much they pay attention to it is another matter. And uh, this is a, a political <laughs> problem all of us are facing, so we've got to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pasok. I would like to recognize a young person, Celia, please. Hello, um, this question is for speaker two. So thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate that you mentioned transnationalism, especially as the overseas Vietnamese community really contributed a lot when central Vietnam was going through a lot of natural disasters recently. So as you know, and some audience members may know, um, the overseas Vietnamese community in the US settled near the coast in California, in the Gulf of Mexico, so Houston, New Orleans, and Florida. And the reason why is that sure fishing communities want to find places to fish and continue to practice their traditional wisdom in places far away from their homeland. So even when they became ref refugees and moved away, they still continue to practice their fishing wisdom. So I want to ask you what you thought about those similarities between our Vietnamese community in the homeland and in um, overseas. And I wanted to ask, Aside from financial funding and remit remittance, which you talk about, how can the overseas community contribute to the homeland, and how can we utilize this global similarity and traditional wisdom? Thank you. Dr. Wang? Yes, um, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, yes, I also done my research in uh, New Orleans as well. I go to, the, to go to New Orleans to study the relationship with them, um, with the Vietnamese Americans in New Orleans with the homeland in Vietnam. So I also explore how the fishing activities have been conducted in, have been practiced in New Orleans. And I think that, um, uh, yes, um, in America, they, uh, they can use a lot of modern technology to use in the fishing industry. So that's, for example, the uh, modern engines that the ship can go longer and can um, provide an, um, uh, more eyes to keep, uh, to keep the, the fish, keep the, the stream longer in the uh, coastal area, in the Gulf Coast. And um, so in the same time in Vietnam, the boats and the engine um, can, uh, um, less, modern, less, less modern than the one in the US. So that's why I think um, the technology is uh, an important, uh, is, uh, di important differences between the community in Vietnam and the one in the US. But all of them, um, every um, time they go to, uh, to fish in the uh, offshore area, they always go to church and pray to God. Uh, before the trip and uh, and to and hope that the God will provide them safety and good catch after they return. So I think um, the faith, the Catholic Catholicism, the Catholic sense of the community is maintained um, internationally uh, in Vietnam as well as in the U.S. because it become their community sense. So uh, they consider themselves as, as Catholics. So they continue to practice the religion and then to consider their homeland parish as their original homeland and they um, continue to um, provide funding and help the community in the homeland to recover after the storm or even um, whenever the homeland parish uh, requests any, uh, uh, any financial aid, they will organize um, some of the fundraising activities to help the homeland parish 
So I think the in internationally, um, the, both the community abroad and the one in Vietnam, they are uh, mutually connected through the religion and through the familiar networks. So I think it is still maintaining right now, and uh, I think in the future they can. Uh, the I think the advantages of the overseas Vietnamese abroad is um, is money, so they can uh, invest in Vietnam to rebuild their church and to be rebuild the infrastructure and to try to uh, maintain the traditional uh, way of life in the homeland community. Thank you, Dr. Huang. Um, any more questions? We, we actually have plenty of time. All right. Um, let me recognize uh, the gentleman wearing a um, light green shirt in front. Well, Dr. Pasuk semi addressed the question. This is an opinion question for you, you guys. Do you think that environmental redemption will really depend upon political revolution? So I believe that um, the three um, speakers can address uh, the question. Who would like to go first, Dr. Pasuk? Well, you, you please tell me what, please tell us your definition of political revolution. the people would have a voice in what policies are being determined rather than that being confined to the elites that you were referring to. Yes, in that case, I think I agree. But, and, and we are, uh, I mean, uh, life is a, a struggle, right? And so I think we are, in this country is so, so struggling to establish a people's voice and uh, we, we are not we're not being um, inert over this issue and I think in other countries also they have not been been negligent on, on this issue but it's uh, m much more difficult than you think I mean developed countries have gone through their uh, you know, much uh, longer, and uh, you you went through the process before us, and uh, the developed countries have had the advantage of uh, having quite a long period of time for change. You talk about the industrial revolution in uh, Europe that was uh, several hundred years ago. You talk about the economic change in uh, this part of the world, it's only one or two generation, 30 to 60 years only. And this kind of dramatic change uh, make it very difficult for people to adjust, uh, you know, uh, mentally, uh, mentally, uh, culturally, and to fight against um, uh, a power a power structure which has been accumulated over over hundreds of years is not an easy matter. And I, although I, I agree with you, and you know we are fighting it, okay. But we also need to have presence internationally. Now, on the climate climate issue, Asia hasn't really have. Uh, a global presence properly. Southeast Asia, in other words, and that's why I said uh, this conference, this international conference is very, very important where so many countries are, are coming together and talking with the younger generation as well, not only the older generation. And, and I even think that the next thing we should do also is to try to uh, uh, make it go down to the secondary school people, children, uh, to, to appreciate and to become part of, of the movement. I mean, direct political revolution can be very dangerous, right? As you all know, 
and 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 this I don't want climate. You to get into trouble. The, the, see this this that I am I am very optimistic and uh, I'm very happy about this conference because climate change is something that affects people co commonly and it's uh, non non political in some ways non political in the sense that it won't get us into trouble it won't get us into jail by by campaigning against climate change <laughs> but if we, we campaign on political revolution that you're talking about we we get into jail or we, got, we had to go out of the country but Climate change is something that is kind of neutral and we can all join. And the youngest generation should be, uh, uh, should be conscientized in all countries. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Dr. Huang, would you like to share your perspective? Yes, uh, according to my idea, um, yes, I think uh, political revolution uh, should not be taken as a violent one, but it should be uh, as a form of movement, of social movement, or of uh, discussion widely, in the national or internationally. Uh, so I think um, in Vietnam, for, for example, you know, many communities in Vietnam has been silent and quiet for the uh, policies or for the application of the policy to the community. So we, uh, this community really need some kind of leadership or leader in the community to help voice the demand of the community for the climate change action. Um, we, in Vietnam, we don't have a traditional system of receiving um, the voice of the people in the local communities. So I think uh, with the international change right now, with the globalization right now, we can learn a lot of lessons from Southeast Asian countries to uh, help the young leadership in Vietnam to uh, use their talent and, uh, as, and train it as a community leaders to collect the voice of the community people and then they can organize some kind of um, uh, yeah, um, revolution in the uh, bracket and uh, uh, voice the demand of the community and uh, make the state, make the government understand and recognize the role of the community for climate change action. Thank you. Dr. Ivami. Can you hear me? All right. I, I'm a believer of political revolution. You know, the yeah. people united can never be defeated. You know, I can believe that. that. Uh, happened to did some dem, uh, uh, demonstration in New York and Chicago as well. Uh, my 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 thought is this: uh, when we return power to people, right? Sometimes people can be stupid too, uh, right? Uh, and uh, and we have seen a lot of revolution where people took over and then. You know, a new elite emerged. Right? There's the people power in the Philippines, right? the rakyat of Malaysia. You know, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I think uh, what we, when we talk about a revolution, is also a revolution in principles, a revolution of values, uh, where we put you know environment top in in our priority list. So that that kind of re revolution, uh, I think, is needed and and uh, challenging. Uh, the, the global discourse of uh, capitalist-led capitalist uh, uh, globalization and very much agree that we can't fight this alone, right? And, and if a particular country you know, really champion this, the neighbor, <laughs> neighboring country say, well, okay, all the investors come over here, I'll, I'll support you. <laughs> and, and that's why ASEAN fails in some, in, in, you know, one, one of the reasons ASEAN fail, uh, uh, because we, we do not work collectively. Right, uh, and we have some members of the ASEAN countries who are very good at having this bi uh, uh, unilateral agreement. Um, so, uh, simply put, I, I agree with the idea, but with, with two important caveats, I think. One is that the people need to have the right mindset with the right value system. The other thing is that it might work in some countries, it might, might not work in some other countries. It depends, I think, in... in um, in, uh, in the context. I mean, Bernie Sanders, I would support, I guess. But he failed to, to win the Democratic uh, nomination, right? So, anyways. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ivami. Now, I would be taking a question from a young person. Okay, let me uh, recognize Kola. Kola?
So this question will be for Dr. Huang. Uh, as the story of disaster that happened, so for the future developments of enhanced their system of mitigation of disaster, so do they have any plan for future to for the younger generation or now generation to uh, well cooperate with the uh, climate change adaptation and disaster prevention more collaboratively with the governments and also the local people? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I also um, asked some people, local people, about um, how they deal with um, uh, future storm or typhoon in the local areas. But uh, most of people didn't have a specific plan for the um, for, for dealing with the future storm or typhoon, but uh, they they explained that uh, because of the young generation, they also migrated to the to the city, to big city, to live. So therefore, in the fishing village, they are, uh, they are only uh, the elderly people and the um, almost uh, 60 years old people who can who continue practice fishing. So therefore, they don't have a, a clear plan to voice their demand um, and to make a, a root, map, root map to have a better um, response to climate uh, change or to uh, this natural disaster in the future. So I hope that um, after this conference or after the voice of the climate change action can reach the local people, they can organize the um, community, community actions or use the church community to uh, bring up the problem in the community, in the organization of the church and organize people and uh, to file a um, solution or to plan for the roadmap to deal with the natural disaster. And in, uh, for, the, for the case of the Vietnamese in, uh, in New Orleans, for, for example, after the disaster of Katrina in 2005, um, the young group, young leadership group has established and they work very well in organizing the community and to uh, listen to the weather um, prediction and then they spread out the news through, through the community uh, well in advance for the fishing community in New Orleans. So therefore, most of the people can have plan to, to evacuate earlier. So I hope that this model can be uh, bring back to, uh, um, to the community in Vietnam and then the young leaders can help the community to well prepare for the future disaster. Thank you, Dr. Huang. I, we still have six minutes left, so we can perhaps take two to three more questions. And let me take the question from the woman wearing a green shawl. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Rosalind um, from Three Muses. My, my background is actually in corporate sustainability consulting. Um, so I've actually advise some of these very big companies on sustainability, but my personal passion is in cultural wisdom. And I've always had a very strong belief, especially after many years in corporate sustainability consulting, I've, I've come to realize actually the answer, I believe, is in traditional wisdom. So I'm so happy for this conference because I found a group of people who, who actually believe the same thing. Um, now, coming from a, a business background, I'm very interested in practical operational mechanisms by which we can create this revolution of principles and values. So I really appreciate uh, Dr. Mohammed's uh, uh, point about decolonizing the social paradigm. Um, I appreciated uh, Dr. Pasuk talking about how, you know, how do we get the, the global elite to shift, you know? Um, and also Kun Jim's question about, um, you know, confronting reality. Because I think we're all in, largely in agreement here that, that there is a role for cultural wisdom, but how to transfer it and how to revolutionize in that way. So I just wanted to share an insight from my experience and then also ask if you've come across anything like this. So um, after I left uh, consulting in corporate uh, after 11 years, I, I uh, kind of created my own venture, which involved at one point uh, building relationships with the Aka tribes in Chiang Rai. And I particularly am interested in food culture, so I explored uh, this with them, but it opened up a whole other world for me. And later I was able to bring executives to uh, 
an, an executive retreat experiencing the Aka way of life. So they were C-suite you know, power brokers, allocators of capital. They were suddenly sitting on the floor of a hut making chili paste and learning, learning being the students of the hill tribes. So, um, of course, some people had a more sig significant transformation than others, but there were people who just came up saying, oh my God, I didn't realize, and I feel, I, you know, I've learned so much, I'm transformed. In your experience, have you, have you seen, um, you know, not, not necessarily things like this, but similar things where the global elite become humans and they undergo personal transformation, or we treat the global elite as human, everybody is a human being. So those thoughts, those desires for power, it comes from an individual place. So it has to come from personal transformation. Have you seen similar things or other types of activities that have created that type of transformation in thought and values? Thank you. Um, uh, let me do a quick one. Um, talking about uh, corporate sustainability consulting and all that, uh, just now there was a question by, I forgot, uh, what can we do together, right? One of the things we could do together is to come up with a certification. Southeast Asian uh, Cultural Heritage Alliance certification a logo right and then we say uh, and any organization who does a b c d will have our certification who will certify c child will certify so that is one way and then, then we can can promote the certification right uh, that that would be and, and it's very effective if there's there's uh, uh, ngo behind it there's uh, 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 there are uh, advertising companies behind it there's corporate uh, communication uh, executives behind it as well. So, the, uh, coming up with the, uh, a, a common certification uh, that we want to use as a benchmark to transform organization is one way we could, we could work collectively, right? And this can be an outcome of our CHR uh, conference. Uh, when you say, have we seen, have, have I seen any uh, example where there's transformation of, of the, the elites, right? Uh, there the, 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 the are two scenarios. One is the, uh, you know, the optics scenario. The elites go down and pretend to be part of the people. You know, they dress up uh, like you know, one of them as well. So that's one scenario. The other scenario, uh, which I have experienced in, in Vietnam, uh, one of the, you know, the best employees in Vietnam, Xuan Trang, of the tree, uh, he actually uh, get the employees to help uh, the patients, the, the clients, without having the media in. It's, it's a CSR project, right? There was this part of my research area, CSR project, that actually removes the media, hence giving more credibility to the project and brings up that, that idea that we are doing this out of our hearts. And that is real transformation of the organization. And to show that uh, you know, organization can really do real sincere stuff without, you know, having the PR slant. Uh, anyway, that, that's, that's my thought about it. Right. Thank you. Dr. Pasok, would you like to respond also? I, I haven't had any uh, personal experience with the kind of elite you were talking about. I cannot answer. But uh, I just wonder if... Uh, uh, this kind of thing is, I mean, it's like uh, the elites also would like to have some kind of holidays, don't they? And it could be anything, whether it, how it affects them is uh, the question. Did you follow? Have they changed after? <laughs> Did you follow that? You know? Can I add a little bit here? So as I, a I don't have, I don't have, I can't answer your question. I'm not an academician, but if you saw my CV, I spent all my life with the power elites, all right? And I actually sit on the board right now of a major Thai multinational company. Um, I can't speak for everyone, but there are um, processes and programs in place that are beginning to push uh, large companies, uh, particularly the whole 
Dow Jones Industrial Average. I think you know the sustainability index and the movement and within the sustainability index to actually have third party certification of all the things that the companies um, have said they will do and have done in order to qualify is a major step forward. Um, certification is not going to be easy. Uh, we work, the company that I'm with work very, very hard to make sure that the things that they are saying they're doing with respect to ESG is really happening. At the flip side, the whole problem, of course, is the issue of stakeholder versus shareholder and the continued need to show profitability, increasing growth, et cetera. So it is a dilemma. Um, it is a very difficult issue. But I do think that there are companies that are striving. Certainly, <laughs> Exxon is a terrible example, right? But there is a flip side. There are very good companies who are really trying hard there. Um, I wanted to take just a moment to talk about maybe some other issues. So many great comments have been made here. Um, my personal observation as a non acquisition is, you know, talking on a very macro level and then showing very strong community level developments. That's wonderful. Um, my concern is with youth and the whole issue of the politics that was raised is, and I think Adan Pasu and I talked about this the other day, is that many young political activists are concerned about uh, personal freedoms, independence, democracy, et cetera, and yet some of them possibly may not be aware of the, of the greater long-term detrimental effects of climate change. The question then is, you know, is there going to be enough awareness for those political activists to turn their attention away, possibly, from political change to actual real climate change? Because ultimately, the world that we've left for them in 50 years is going to be somewhat unlivable. And I would hope that the youth here understands that. Political change is great, but climate change is going to affect your life. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Camille. Would the speakers like to respond to um, Kun Camille's um, reflections? Um, and may I say something here? Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, the, the, the kind of political change the young people are demanding will have enormous implications on uh, policy making and climate change. I, I can't talk about other countries, but certainly in this country, the uh, high concentration of political power, particularly in the hands of the military, and uh, is, is really uh, moving us backward. We can't trust, we can't trust uh, generals to understand the intricacies of the issue of climate, climate change. Um, so I think that we can't, we can't just dismiss their interest in uh, political as uh, not being uh, concerned with the climate issue. It, it is related. And if I may also add uh, a perspective coming from a young person, um, that I believe that politics and climate change action are inseparable, that both of them go together, and that climate action would require um, collective actions. And with collective actions, that would mean democratic processes and participation of, of course, young people, more and more young people, awareness, yes, but also at the same time, um, it shouldn't just end with awareness raising initiatives, really, but how do we really move it forward and get that support to be able to transform these into tangible actions? So perhaps it's a, we hope that it happens now, but um, 
pragmatically speaking, I believe it's still a very long way to go, also considering the diversity of political structures in Southeast Asia. I mean, I come from the Philippines. And being a climate activist, I don't recognize myself as a climate activist, but a cultural heritage advocate. But just by being branded as a climate activist, in a way, is a bit dangerous in my country because of red tagging and all these political associations. But I would like to recognize other young people in the room if you would like to react um, with regard to that. Joshua, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think there is a, uh, you guys talk about ASEAN and also uh, and a little bit um, context on uh, youth uh, giving a priority on certain issues I, I like to put them all together so um, i think there's a different perspective where uh, youth in south asia need to approach certain issue and first thing that we have to bear in mind most of the asean member states are very top bottom society so um, we a lot of the strategies that we learn uh, to influence change is a bottom top approach and for many it's quite difficult uh, to uh, to influence the government in the sense and there's not really a lot of a top what like a, a how to say a concept not for youth or how can we work from a top bottom approach I think that's one thing that we need to address and I've asked this uh, multiple times like how can we have a uh, is there a, a someone or a concept not or something that can teach us how to work with uh, I, I would say governments that uh, deal things from a top bottom approach and, uh, and and as you can and and you say as well it is climate action doesn't discriminate it affects all types of form of government it's just how we need to strategize i think that's one thing we could acknowledge my second point is um, yeah, um, uh, getting businesses involved is one of the more difficult uh, things, I guess. Some are already uh, kind-hearted and we can see that shift right now with the establishment of ESG and many CSR focusing on climate reality projects and you may argue that it is uh, greenwashing to some extent. Um, I but. I think ASEAN as an organization are very economic, economic centric. So sometimes when you give them solution, they want to also, okay, you give green solution, okay, this is how we try to help the trees, or try to re rehabilitate the ecosystem. And then they're like, what is the economic uh, incentive here? And sometimes it can be frustrating, but for me, um, since I've been a little bit touching on the nudges working with the, um, the ASEAN world, I would say. I try to kind of learn how to give a, I guess, a, some form of monetary incentive for them to like consider, oh, okay, maybe we can look at this approach. So yeah, that's my two questions. So because of the um, very engaged audience, we are actually extending until 12.15, so five minutes more. So if you still have questions, we can still recognize and answer them. Let me recognize Komori. Komori? Hi, I have a question regarding decolonization. So we see a lot of decolonization decolonizing efforts in current museums. For example, the British Library has returned um, looted Yogyakarta manuscripts to Indonesia. Um, they have also digitized um, the physical copies um, for the public. I wonder what are your opinions regarding um, re restitution of objects, whether those efforts are enough for decolonizing, you know, like prior colonial powers, um, or is, still, is there still a power dynamic or a power play between um, previously um, col colonial powers who have previously engaged in looting objects and, and subjects of col colonization? Thank you. Shall, shall I answer the question? Yes, yeah, Dr. Right. Ivani, okay. please. Uh, I just 
very, very good question you have there. Um, the, the presentation that I made was uh, mainly uh, addressing our Southeast Asian audience. Yeah? But if you're talking about uh, uh, restoring justice, yeah? there's, a, there's a term called recti rectificatory justice, which means to rectify the sins of the past, right? And uh, it, is, it is part of a, a play, uh, Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, so if, you know, if us children, right, uh, you know, ha leading a happy life, a, a prosperous life, but we have a neighbor who's poor, right? But we say, you know, it is not my fault that you're poor, but if my father stole the property from your father, right, and then both of them passed away, but I benefited from the stolen goods or stolen properties of, uh, of my father, then it is just for me to rectify the sins of the past because I have benefited from it. So if you look at uh, you know, the Netherlands and the British, they actually, you know, uh, Portuguese, I'm saying because Malaysia is colonized by Portuguese, Dutch, British, Japanese, and then Jap British again. Uh, they, they built their country at the back of the slaves of the uh, you know, of, of, of us developing countries mainly right so you were talking about restoring justice then they will need to repay you know, rectify the sins of their ancestors right? uh, if you're talking about that right? uh, uh, yeah, returning artifacts is very is it very important it's the first step but if you're talking about rectifying the mistakes, the sins, the, the crimes of the past, right? There must be more than that that should have been done, right? Uh, that, would be, that would be my thought, right? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rivami. Uh, I would just like to recognize also the question that was asked um, by our online audience. Um, the person who asked this question is Api Chai. He, he or she said, I agree with you, Dr. Rivani, um, that the concept of commons should be more widely revitalized. There is, of course, the British Commonwealth, which had been in existence for quite some time with a specific aim in mind. Would you agree that perhaps we should create a Commonwealth, spelled with a small c, in the true sense of the word, to address the issues we are facing, facing today? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there should be Commonwealth of a lot of different things, right? Commonwealth of... You know, people, the, the, the NGOs, Commonwealth, you know, all, all of us must come together. But what's important is we need to have, uh, you know, fair representation in, in the system, in the, in the system that we establish. Otherwise, again, we'll go back to the, you know, a, a ruling elite <laughs> dominating the discourse Finish. and the agenda. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rivani. Um, we only have one minute left. I don't know if you still have a question. They'll have a question? All right. Okay, so this would be the last question that we would be taking before we go for lunch. Um, yes, sir, please. Okay, Elliot is going to give you. Yes. Um, yeah, just uh, curious to, to gain uh, your input uh, on the, the, co the representation of the so-called indigenous community in the practice many times in Indonesia, you need to understand whether this is a true representation or a misrepresentation. Many times, in, for example, in the Ikaya Nusantara case, there is suddenly an emerging communities, local communities emerging. And there are waves of them. They call, the, they call themselves Dayaks. Yeah? But then after we scrutinize, most of them, probably nine out of the ten, they are not the true real communities. They are representation of either elites or a representation of either local uh, sort of like uh, rulers or even political parties behind them yeah. or even the military sometimes. And the ultimate objective is to gain access to land or gain access to whatever the wealth being poured in because our government will spend a lot of money in this area. So it happens also in the Yogyakarta, I suppose, if this is not managed well. The street vendors along the Malioboro in the past, before it's being uh, so-called managed well, it was actually haunted by so-called uh, the local sort of uh, 
brokers, yeah, and they are they are doing this in the name of the communities. So how do we deal with this so-called um, ill intent or probably misrepresentation of the people who's using the name of the indigenous uh, communities? Thank you. Okay. Dr. Okay, right, right, okay. Uh, I mean, there are two levels in answering that, right? Uh, one is the significance of indigenous representation in the, 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 the wealth that's been generated in that area. So in, in Yogyakarta, for instance, Maliboro, a lot of them are from Minang, from, from Sumatra, from Minang, <laughs> from locals. They are not, they are not uh, from Jawa, Jawa not from uh, 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 Jawa Tengah, uh, sorry. Central Jawa. Central Jawa, so from yeah. Central Jawa, right. Uh, that happens. In Jakarta, the, the Batawis, right? Yeah. Uh, the local, the indigenous people, the Putra Daerah, the term in Indonesia, are being marginalized as well, right? right? Uh, I remember going to uh, 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 Parapat in, 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 in Sumatra, north of Sumatra, the Bata, uh, mm. the Christian Bata. They feel they've been colonized, they've been, they're being marginalized as well as uh, when they have a factory set up, then they're not representing them. The Papuans, right, have, have the same uh, emotion. I remember I was an outsider, I carried out research over there. They said, you know, if, you, if, if the wealth of, of, of Newport, which is you know, the, the biggest mine in, for, uh, biggest gold mine in, in the Papua, world, right, yeah. is passed down to them, then not only them will be rich, the children will be rich, right? Yeah. So the issue here is this, whenever there's development, right, whenever there's uh, wealth being generated, the, the, the indigenous people of that group must be recognized, must be, uh, must be shared, the, the wealth must be shared with them. There's, there should not be uh, any argument against this, but that has, that's not happening. Right? I think what's, what's happening with uh, yeah, the, the, the new proposed administrative center of, of, uh, of Indonesia, uh, uh, Nusantara in, in Borneo, uh, there are many dynamics behind that story too. I think uh, part of it, is the, the political uh, elites trying to, the local political elites to try to uh, uh, assert the presence there, right? Yeah. Uh, the other part is to show, to demonstrate that, uh, you know, that, that Jakarta is not imposing on the people of Kalimantan, right? People of Borneo, right? So to show that they are you know, engaging with the, there's, there's, there's uh, local engagement with the people there. Uh, but then, you know, the structures in, in Indonesia is such that oftentimes it is represented by the LSM, by the ORMAS, yeah. by, the, you know, by the different types of NGOs. So uh, that has probably more to do with uh, the, the, the systems in the, in the society more than, more than uh, you know, the, the problem of not having them in. So the idea is the government has to do you know, a, a due process kind of thing to, to identify the, the locals in, in that area instead because of letting the peop these power players do the do many the job. many times the selection process is by by formal means you have to submit uh, a legal entity etc ah, et yeah, yeah. and nowadays even making it worse they're making it online so <laughs> some of this indigenous uh, society they don't even have yeah. internet connection yeah, yeah. so so the formal the formal sort of like procedures yeah become a hindrance for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I think this is something that we yes, need yes. to... Uh, so we have technology that, that alienates the, the local, right? Yes. And sometimes alienate me too. Like. <laughs> Depending where we are, <laughs> which, which, which uh, era we are come from. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. okay, recognizing that I believe that our stomachs are grumbling now. <laughs> Perhaps it's time for lunch. Um, so I would like to extend our gratitude to our distinguished speakers um, this afternoon, Dr. Ivani, Dr. Pasuk, and Dr. Huang. Thank you very much for your valuable insights and perspectives. And just to wrap up really, really quickly, we learned a lot today about how um, Dr. Ivani's presentation, how he emphasized the decolonization of paradigms from property, knowledge, and development, from Dr. Pasok's really engaging um, discourse on how el elite politics influence climate action or inaction, and also from Dr. Huang's um, confrontation of realities and disasters through a very good case study in Vietnam through community resilience that has been strengthened by religion. Um, I believe that I would just really like to summarize this into one sentence that was actually engaged by Dr. Rivani, that 
People united can never be defeated. Thank you very much, everybody. Let's enjoy our lunch. Thank you very much to our, both of our moderators and our speaker, especially um, Ajahn Pasu for stepping in at the last minute in the absence of two earlier planned speakers. So thank you. Um, and also, may I take this opportunity to thank Thai Bev and also the Embassy of Indonesia for our scrumptious break, uh, lunch, and sorry, scrumptious snacks and beverages this morning. And just before we go off to lunch, um, this afternoon we have quite a long session of lunch so that you can continue the discussion. I'm sure there's a lot of thought-provoking and interesting things that you can discuss more. But if you have time, we have um, the Kamting House and also the library that remains open in case you need to visit. And the last point for me for now is that a lot of the, all of the session has been put on live stream since the first day. So now you can find them online on our Facebook page. And we'll resume back at 1.45. Yeah, thank you.